it's still amazing the amount of people that would rather yell about Glenn being wrong than, oh, I don't know, using and enjoying the gear that they spent so much money on. Well, as we learned last week on SMG Viewers Comments, most people don't actually want helpful tips on how to make better guitar recordings in their home studio. What they're looking for is validation for their luxury purchases. <laughs> Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to another edition of SMG Viewers Comments. Let's skip the crap and get right to your crap. Regarding pushing Apple, Glenn always pushes the more expensive option to those of us who are recording at home and don't have a YouTube channel to support those more expensive options. He'll push the $300 microphone where a $150 one has been proven to be just as good. Here he's pushing Apple when Windows is just as good. I've never used anything Apple and have never had the problems that people claim the reason for not using a Windows machine. It isn't 1994 anymore. Windows machines are far more reliable than they were 20 years ago. It just isn't true anymore. Well, hey there, Frank. Thanks so much for stopping by and sharing with us your amazing observation skills. Apparently, you might have missed the episode where I talked about this amazing Harley Benton double cut, which is like $269 and happens to be one of my absolute favorite guitars. Or, you know, the countless times I've mentioned the Lewitt 340 TT Tom Mike. This is 99 bucks, which is a viable alternative to the much more expensive Sennheiser MD 421. This is what, 350, $400, this is 99 bucks. I always tell people, get this first. These are fucking great. They will save you a fortune. You can get three of these for the price of one of these, maybe even four. And if you're drummers like most metal drummers, you're only gonna have to buy 17 more to individually mic up all the elements of his kit. Oh yeah, I also mentioned this all the time as well, the Lewitt LCT 240 Pro, $119 at Sweetwater. It's an amazing guitar mic, it's an amazing counter to say like an SM57 pairs up great with it. So my suggestion to you, Frank, would be maybe, I don't know, watch the fucking show before you shoot off your big stupid mouth? Just an idea. I mean, that's a great opening argument, but good luck affording a double amp. Well, imagine being a jumble owner and then one day finally realizing after spending all that money that the reason the amp sounds so great isn't so much the unique circuit design or any kind of voodoo going on, but it has more to do with the speaker that it's plugged into. That's gotta hurt. Hi Glenn, I think with the internet evolution, we can now really hear the difference or similitudes of the gear and don't fall with the marketing campaigns and the whole industry myths. In the 90s, they were selling us ideas of tone woods, cables, pickups, even body shapes. There's no one to compare to or the technology at the time. PD, sorry for my English, it's not May language. Oh, that's okay, Enrique. Your mastery of the English language is uh, far more advanced than some musicians who, who are supposed native speakers who've come to contribute on this show, believe me. At least I could say your stuff out loud. I've had some guys in here commenting and it's like I have to read it about seven times before I can actually pronounce it out loud. It's like, guys, if you're gonna comment, try saying it out loud first and, and with respect to somebody actually might want to attempt to read it out loud at some point, just, just a big help. But I think Enrique's got a good point though. You know, they tried to sell us all this crap, especially when all we had was magazines back in the day. It's really hard to hear how something sounds from a magazine ad. And that's why YouTube's been so successful, especially in terms of say doing guitar re gear review and studio gear review, that kind of stuff. Cause you can actually make AB comparisons and they go, hmm, yeah, maybe some of this doesn't make too much sense. That's the wonderful thing about the cost of recording coming down so much is that we can make these tests and do, do our own evaluations and find out what's really happening. The downside is now we've got guys who, you know, who uh, spend a lot of time learning how to shred on their guitars and somehow they think that their nine minute, you know, jerk off fest over a, over a fretboard is somehow music. Hi Glenn, what is your opinion on the whole Dolby Atmos mixing thing? Hey, you know what? I've been very impressed so far. I got to check out the Atmos room at Cali Audio in Burbank. I got to check out the Atmos room at Sweetwater. Very cool stuff. And then a couple days after Nam, I, I was kind of, Dweezil Zappa was kind enough to invite us over to his place. And we got to check out some of the Atmos mixes he was doing. And there were some work in progresses, but I mean, like we're talking, I'm talking like, you know, just hair standing on end. That guy is another level uh, when it comes to mixing in Atmos. Wow. I mean, like I sat there in the sweet spot and I just had my mind blown. I, this is, to me, is what digital audio's true potential is. It's being able to do this multi-channel thing and just make the mixes go into places you would have never dreamed. So big salute to Dweezil. Like, dude, you're just crushing it with those mixes. Guy's also an insanely talented guitar player as well. It'd be super cool to get him on the show at some point. Don't you think, guys? Maybe, maybe I'll leave a comment below and see if, you, see if you, we can make that happen. 
Anyway, Dweezil, seriously, thanks so much for having us. Uh, that was such a cool experience. Uh, yeah, so Atmos Mixing, definitely this is where the future is going. I mean, you know, they managed in the 90s to convince everybody to switch over to 5.1 systems, and it was pretty cool, but hopefully uh, that the stereo manufacturers managed to convince people to invest in Atmos systems because that's just a whole nother level of awesome. I'm not buying into the whole save your money thing. It's generating cheap controversy for clinics, to be honest. Some musicians actually do care about their instrument and how it plays and responds. It's not even a particularly expensive thing to explore and pursue. Most people don't buy guitars that cost thousands. Most play sub $1,000 guitars, more likely instruments, anywhere from 300 to 800 bucks. That's even true for many touring musicians in the metal circuit. And most of those are perfectly fine. Also, pickups are a fucking cheap way to help you get the timber and response of a guitar you're perhaps not 100% happy with. And most of the guys in the bands I personally know have good quality speakers in their cats to begin with. Give it a rest already come up with actually interesting or helpful stuff to talk about. The whole shtick with the idiot guitar player who plays with his eyes, leaves the mythology and goes into debt to buying guitars made of mythical tone with a boutique pickup is absolutely not representative of the majority of players. Most of you idiots have spent more money on clothes and stuff in your Steam library you ended up not even playing. I guess the dumb bass player jokes has run its course, so we need to come up with some new story for the rooms to get behind. Well, that's just the thing. I love sub $1,000 guitars, especially ones like this 10S that just play absolutely brilliantly and sound great. And you don't need to upgrade the pickups either. See, that's the thing about the whole pickup thing. I'm not yelling that guitar players are idiots. I'm yelling at younger me as the idiot. That's it, because I fell for all that shit. I bought the pickups and I went, well, why is my tone not changing in any kind of measurable way? Oh. Well, because they're not doing what we've been told that they do. We've told, oh, you want to upgrade your guitar tone, change your pickups. Turns out that's fucking nonsense. Going from one humbucker to another really isn't going to make a big difference in terms of tone. It might in output, but as for a big paradigm and tone shift, fuck no, that's complete nonsense. But nobody ever said that. Everybody's like, no, spend your money. Uh, same thing uh, when it comes with vacuum tubes. Again, oh, your amp sounds tinny or buzzy. Oh, change your tubes up. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh, and when you talk about guys who have good speakers in their cabinets, you know, that's honestly not really been the case in my experience. A lot of people uh, will spend, you know, a lot of money on a guitar and then buy the cheapest cabinet they can find. I mean, like one of the big culprits I'm thinking of right now is, you know, the new 5150 Iconic. Great fucking amp, no question about it. The cabinet, the speakers in that cabinet are questionable quality at best. And it kind of seems to be the thing when you slap a 5150 name on a product. Uh, the, the head is great, but the cabinet sucks. Like the original 5150 cabinet, with the one with the shit fields in there, that thing was a complete hunk of shit. So yeah, check what speakers you have, folks. Pop the back off your cabinet and take a look and make sure you've got something quality in there. Because chances are, if you've got a problem and you're not happy with the tone you're getting, it's a very good chance it's your fucking speaker that needs to be changed out. And it's not like I'm asking you guys to drop a whole lot of money on speakers either. You know, by way of comparison, like you check out one of those, this is a Mototone British Vintage speaker. I'm gonna be checking some of these out on a couple of episodes coming up, but uh, with my experiment so far, yeah, these are pretty fucking amazing and a pretty significant upgrade to say like the really crap Jensen's that shipped with those original Behringer cabs that a lot of you guys have bought, you know, maybe 10 years ago or whatnot in, in need of a serious upgrade. Turns out those cabinets are great if you put good speakers in. Uh, this this would be a far better investment for your money, in my opinion, than say a set of pickups. This speaker here costs $110. Uh, so a pair of these would cost 220 bucks. A brand new set of EMGs will cost you 200 bucks. A brand new set of Seymour's will cost you 200 bucks. A set of Fishman Fluence will cost you about 260. You're gonna get a far more significant improvement in tone with a pair of these than you would with a pair of new pickups. That's not just me talking out of my ass. That's something that I've proven time and again on this show. Ignore at your own risk. And what if there's no speakers? The tone then in the algorithm? Well, Mark, the tone would be in the impulse response. And what's an impulse response? It's a digital capture of a speaker and a microphone. You know, the signal chain that every guitar sound goes through as it's being recorded? Try playing with a few of those. You might enjoy the results. Another way of looking at it is, hey, you know what? If you don't believe about tone being in the speaker, plug the back of your amp directly into your recording interface and see how good that sounds. Hey Glenn, I'm in the market for a new speaker or set of speakers for my cabinet after watching your videos on the topic. I'm looking for something that has great high mid-range but isn't too boomy or harsh. I've had my eye on the Celestion Midnight 60. Any experience with this one? Also, fuck you. 
Uh, no, honestly, I can't say I have tried that one. I wouldn't even know where to start with that one. Um, I've got some new Jensen's coming in that are a, little, a lot more high end than the ones that shipped with the Behringer's. I'm very intrigued uh, with those. I got a chance to check them out at NAMM. Thought they were really cool. Might be a viable option. You can also check out the Eminence DV77s. Those are super cool as well. Uh, if you want something with a really cool mid-range, though, check out the Celestian EVHs. Those are basically an updated mix six, mid-60s uh, Celestian Greenback, and they are fucking amazing, and they pair up so nice with the Celestian Hempback. As we discovered in that video where I shot all that stuff out, it's in the channel trailer now. You can always watch that if you want. It's definitely worth having a look. However, I will stress this, though. The trick with speakers is watch a few YouTube demos so you can hear what stuff actually sounds like before before you buy. That is absolutely critical. Uh, see if you can see if there's a couple of different demos of that Midnight 70. Who knows, you might like what you hear, you might not. Uh, for the more mid-rangey stuff, especially what's working in a modern sense with mid-rangey stuff, I highly recommend checking out Johan Segborn's channel. He's got some really cool ideas, great stuff. I just want to pop in and say I argued for hours with some jack wagon on the Marshall Facebook group uh, that is all about premium tubes and how great they are. When I presented this amazing video to support my argument that tubes do very little to change the tone, he called this pseudoscience filled with holes and gaps. No surprise, but when I asked him for details on the holes and gaps, he resorted to insulting me. Just a stun fun story, lol. Remember what I said at the beginning of the video? People are looking for validation for their luxury purchases. Yes, those premium tubes definitely fall into the luxury purchase category. And believe me, as the idiot who spent way too much money on premium tubes about 10 years ago when I was working with fans, looking for some edge that was gonna finally give me the breakthrough guitar sounds I was looking for. Yeah, it turns out it did two things to my tone, jack and shit. Sure, it'll give you longevity, but we're talking studio amps here that never fucking go anywhere. Fat lot of good that does, that's for sure. Certainly didn't give me any kind of tone advantage. Yeah, that's the thing about uh, the guy saying, oh, it's all pseudoscience filled with holes and gaps. Uh, yeah, well, it's kind of funny that he resorted to the personal insults when she said, hey, can you back up those claims at all? That tends to happen quite a bit when people are caught with their dicks in their hands. Oh, well, you know what? I've always said this. The only thing that beats science is better science. Still waiting for somebody to make a better test. It's been about a year since that video came out. A little bit longer, even. Much loved and treasured advice guy, Glenn Fricker. Aren't most modern speaker cabs made from composite fiberboard? What would happen if a person were to hand make a cabinet out of cheap pine board? Say with a frame of solid wood and straight solid 12 by three quarter inch approximately, and perhaps some silicone. Some acoustic treatment, also just curious. Hey Damon, uh, the great thing about cabinets these days, you can get them uh, made of all kinds of different things. I mean, like a lot of companies still use like really strong plywood. I know the Engel stuff uses like, you know, five eight Siberian birch is just like rock fucking salt and they still build them to that standard, which is great. So if you're looking for a nice tour worthy chunk of wood, yeah, I'd go with the Engel cabs. They're fucking incredible. Uh, that's the big thing about MDF cabs is they're solid until you get them wet and then you're fucked. The only people who make an MDF cabs that are really cool in my opinion are the guys from Happy Cabs who take MDF but they cover the cabinets with like truck bed liner. So the stuff's solid as a rock, it's waterproof. They're just fucking amazing. I've got my selection blackback sitting in that cabinet and it fucking just sounds ungodly. Uh, Jim Lil did an amazing video on cabinets and the biggest uh, contributor tone in a guitar cabinet is its geometry, not the actual physical makeup. I did an experiment where we shot three different two by 12s out made from different material. And the worst sounding one was the one made out of particle board because it would resonate and had, had a frequency. So it turns out tone wood is actually something you really don't want in the sound of an electric guitar or an electric guitar cabinet because you get this horrible, um, overwhelming frequency that just sits on top of everything and it's just fucking awful. The only thing that you can counter that would be bracing. So if you want to build, say, a cabinet out of some cheap pine or something like that, go for it. But you're going to have to figure out a way to keep it from vibrating. So you are going to have to add some internal bracing. Start with that. You might like the results you get. Good luck, dude. What baffles me about these videos is how some people think their opinions are more valid than facts. No, bullshit is still bullshit no matter how often or loud you repeat it. There's nothing to be ashamed of in being incorrect. Take it on board and learn from it. Yeah, you know, I gotta admit, I think that's the, the right approach is when you make a mistake, own it and, and move the fuck on, learn from it. I've made mistakes on this show. You guys have called me out and I'm like, hey, you know what? You guys were right. I fucked up. Great, we learned something. Let's move on. You know, I did that video there where I, I, I was so excited about getting a video out the door about a cheap Chinese microphone. I had it facing the wrong way. And you guys are like, you dumb motherfucker. And I'm like, I am a dumb motherfucker. So yeah, it happens. So bottom line, I would agree with that comment. There's absolutely no shame in admitting you're wrong. It's when you make a mistake and refuse to admit it. That is when you're a complete dickhead. Great review. Save me a few bucks. 
Hey, dude, you know what? That's great. I'm I'm really happy to know that I helped save you some money. That's the whole point of the show. Honestly, when it comes to Marshall these days, they're looking like more of a fashion brand than an actual guitar amp maker. I mean, like, Marshall headphones? What the fuck's up with that? What happened to building kick-ass guitar amps? I know, I know. Gotta, 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 you know, stoke that bottom line one way or another. Keep that money machine rolling, and they, there's a lot of money to be made with that great, big, wonderful Marshall logo. Stick it on anything, people are gonna be dumb enough to buy it. Even if it is a complete piece of shit, like the Marshall Code 25. Unrelated long shot question, but Glenn, I need to know the song, your mixed review, when the band made a music video with a psycho Barbie and a dollhouse. Been over your page, and I hope to didn't disappear or get struck down. Thanks, if you can help with this, hope you're having a good, good one. Hey, Hugh, uh, the band you're looking for was Fiona 9-Inch Apple. Uh, they did that, what the fuck was that, the cover? The track was called Sleep to Dream. Yes, it's still on YouTube. Uh, it actually won that year's uh, Oldies But Baddies contest, which was an awful lot of fun. Um, thinking of contests, I, I might do another one at some point, but it's probably just gonna be doing live streams because every time I made one of these videos and I do a review video, it'd get claimed. So it's just like basically you know, throwing all my efforts right down a great big incinerator. So that kind of sucked. When we did the first Oldies But Baddies competition, YouTube hadn't gone completely insane with the copyright claims. And it was pretty good. It was a lot of fun, but the last one was just a total bitch to get through. So yes, considering doing another cover song contest, I've got a great theme in mind for it. So if we can get some cool sponsors, and if you guys don't mind me doing the reviews live, uh, we'll definitely check it out and make it happen because I'd love to see what you guys can do. Uh, now that they're, they're, you know, not everybody's in lockdown, you can actually go out and make music videos again. So it might be an awful lot of fun. If that's something you guys want to see, of course, I want to hear from you. Please leave a comment below. Glenn! I totally agree with the tone is in the speaker thing. I read a study about vitamin supplements. For patients, if they took one supplement, didn't matter which one, had no effect in relation to the control group. But the group that took all the supplements did see some actual changes. Now that brings me to my proposal. Take one speaker, do two recordings of the same thing, and put them in different wood, different cabinet. The guitar is made out of different kind of wood, different humbucker, different, and so on. I'd really love to see if it makes a difference. Well, dude, I've actually done that. If you watch my video, what actually changes guitar sound, um, I do a very elaborate test on all that, and I show the differences between changing guitars versus changing microphones versus changing changing speakers and cabinets and all that kind of thing and really lay it out in a very easy to understand format, uh, which unfortunately turns out to be very difficult for a lot of musicians to understand because it just makes too much sense. Since you mentioned it in this video, are there any channels you would recommend for shooting and editing video? I learned a little bit of this in school, but admittedly paid no attention because I wanted to be a mix engineer and not a video guy. Hey Mark, yeah, fortunately there's all kinds of amazing stuff out there. There's a bunch of channels I follow regularly, and I say this to anybody who's into audio mixing and whatnot, learn some camera skills, learn some basic editing, because you never know when you might need that more than your audio skills. Like, let's face it, recording studios are closing left, right, and center, but we do need good video editors out there. Uh, I, I can wholeheartedly say that. We need good video editors. So that, that would be a skill worth picking up. Yes, I understand you want to make the most awesomely brutal metal mix ever, but so does everybody else. Learn how to fucking edit. Uh, as for channel recommendations, uh, what I've really gotten into lately uh, is for those of us who uh, work in the DaVinci Resolve platform uh, is Mr. Alex Tech. He's really cool. He's got all kinds of cool uh, DaVinci Resolve tips and that kind of shit. And he does some like custom uh, plugins himself that he gives away for free. Yeah, awesome, dude. Uh, some other guys I watch are Potato Jet. He's always got great camera reviews. And um, Gerald Undone, he's a little bit more techy. He's based in London, Ontario. Met the dude last fall at this uh, camera convention in Toronto. Really, really chill dude. I love his work. He does some really killer stuff. Uh, the other one I would think of, if, if you know, like vlogging style stuff, check out uh, Camera Conspiracies. That guy is fucking hilarious. He's awesome. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot to go over out there. The, the problem is with a lot of editing channels, you know, it usually takes them about five minutes before they, in a video before they actually get to anything useful. Kind of one of the things that inspired this show, to be honest with you, I was trying to learn color grading about a decade ago and just, hey guys, in today's video, we're gonna do this, but first you need to go to file. Oh, it's like, yeah, we already know how the file system works, dipshit. Give us the thing we clicked on for. Seriously, no, no, no. We don't need, we don't need the fucking bullshit in the beginning. Just get to the fucking point. Big help as far as tutorials are concerned. You know, that, that's the real trick though, is learning as an editor how to cut all that bullshit out and realize that your audience aren't complete morons. That is, unless they play bass. A lot of people complain that Glenn sounds like a broken record, but a lot of musicians need to hear something a lot before it sinks in. He gave, saved me a shit ton of money when his videos, among others, showed that Gibson might not be worth it. Got my Schecter E1, and it's great. If the pickup rant started earlier, I would have saved money on that, too. Keep rocking, Glenn. 
Hey, Cody, thanks so much. I really appreciate that. I got to say this, though. I didn't really get on the pickup thing until I started doing that audio engineer roundtable with Ethan Weiner and Pipeline. You know, we started discussing things like that and things that actually make real changes. Uh, Ethan is a big inspiration, great audio engineer, and he knows how to cut through the bullshit like nobody I've ever met in my entire life. So um, I can barely hold a candle to Ethan's knowledge. Uh, but he did inspire me to start taking a look at pickups and see what's really going on. Turns out a pickup, all it is is about a 2 to 3D boost on a particular resonant frequency that you put before the amp. Now ask yourself this, if you've ever taken an equalizer pedal and put it before a distortion pedal or after a distortion pedal, where does that make the most difference? It's the same thing with a pickup, except it's permanently stuck before the distortion. All right, everybody, that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for watching. Please, for the love of Crom, hit the subscribe button. Uh, YouTube's been purging a lot of old accounts lately, and I'm like, what the fuck's going on with my subscribers? So I need your help. If you haven't hit it, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm going to keep the tutorials and myth busting coming because it's an awful lot of fun. If you guys want to be around for that and maybe learn something cool along the way, I'd love to see you on here. So that being said, I'll see you next week. And until then, let's make some great music together.